Magnus Carlsen took the lead at the 2019 FIDE World Rapid Chess Championship on day two, in large part because of two very, very key victories. I want to show you both of those games in back-to-back -back videos here for Chess.com's YouTube channel, starting with this victory by the world champion with the white pieces over Czech Republic Grandmaster Victor Lesnica. Let's dive in. So, Magnus starts with d4, and the key thing here is we see him employ what is a pretty effective rapid repertoire, starting with a London system. Now, uh, we talk about these system openings as being effective in faster time controls because, again, the, the structures are uh, built on patterns, and if you play a lot of games in those systems, you're going to get middle games and tactics that you're more familiar with than your opponent. Some of the disadvantages, of course, in longer time control games where your opponents have a lot of time to prepare can be that they, they maybe lack some bite, right? And that's why you don't see them played as often in slower time control events uh, where players can anticipate it and really dive in to the best system and approach as black. But you will see it played a lot in these rapid and blitz events, again, because it's, it's effective. It's something you can play quickly, knowing that you're in control of the preparation and your opponent doesn't really have any surprises coming your way. So after knight b to d2 and then bishop e7, we see Magnus start the party with the move knight e5. Now, again, if we're talking about effective moves that are showing that you're in control of the direction of the game, knight e5 is a good one. You're immediately occupying the most critical square in the center that you have control over. You're preparing both ideas common developing moves like bishop d3, but also putting yourself in a position where things like g4 and h4 and h5 can come pretty quickly. Uh, the point of these systems is that if white has the ability to launch an attack on the king side with tempi, you're going to look at getting black getting in a lot of trouble. So Lesnika does not do this, but just to show an example, something like castles might already be met by g4 and h4. And you might see white really just throw a ton of material here at the king side. Uh, even the engines will give white an edge in this type of thing, in addition to the practical value of attacking your opponent in a rapid game. So because of that, Lesnika plays the move h5 to overprotect the g4 square. Now, this is in theory a novelty. h6 is a move that has been played. Uh, a game where Nidich, German Grandmaster, had the white pieces continued with g4. And then h4, so sort of the same idea I've been highlighting here with g5. And white ended up getting a pretty good position here, kind of an all-out type of attack here, forces black to play f6 because of the pressure over here on the king side. Uh, and eventually, Nidich was better in this position here against uh, Chinese Grandmaster Zhong. So uh, we back up and, and just give you a quick example of, of maybe why h6 wasn't played. Uh, Lesnika had more direct intentions in mind to stop the world champion's plans. But now we're back to bishop d3, as I said, a natural developing move takes, knight takes, knight bd7. The queen comes to e2, which is flexible here. White has not committed yet to castling long. We know that uh, it is rapid and Magnus might want this type of attack, but the queen on e2 prepares a number of things. Could be preparing f3 and e4. Could be preparing to play for c4. The queen is overprotecting. Excuse me, not like a knight. She doesn't move that way, but the center here. Uh, and again, you're also opening the idea of castling long. Now, after knight e4, h3, and the trade happened, Bishop d6. Magnus decided to make this trade and then go ahead and castle long. I think that white probably has a tiny edge regardless. Uh, if you go in for the, I guess, longer castling, usually associated with more aggressive intentions. I think white's a little better even if you castle short. Um, and because of that, the engines kind of say that maybe even just rook c1 is a natural way to play this position as well. But from a practical point of view, again, I like castles. And now it, it sort of forced black's hand to play the move h4. The reason he played this is because, let's say you make some other move, I analyzed queen c7, white can play g4, and if h4 now, you haven't really stopped me from getting a, a huge space advantage over here on the king side, and this h4 pawn could eventually become weak. Uh, it's a little overextended, right? Only, only getting the protection from the rook because advancing the pawn probably not possible. So white, white has an edge in positions like this. Um, and of course, Magnus could also play similarly to how he did in the game, preparing for f3 and e4. So I like this move, Castles Long. Black plays h4 to stop the expansion. 
after king to b1, knight f6. Here we get the move f3. So the idea here is to put the queen on e2, try to play for e4, and white's better strategically in this position just based on the fact that black's pawns are doubled and that white holds the cards. These pawns that are doubled here are not the weakest double pawns you can have, right? We talk about double pawns being true weaknesses when they're on an open file, uh, when they're isolated, right? They're really lacking protection, not just from each other, but from other pieces. In a situation like this, these pawns do control some critical squares. So I would say the main point to white's advantage is that white holds the cards, whether I want to play for c4, whether I want to play for e4. Maybe I prepare e4 with the rook so that my queen can stay on the dark squares, right? The main thing here is that Magnus got himself a very flexible position from the start, a position where he was in control of, call it the tempo of the game with this London system. There was no preparation that was going to surprise him. And I think it was exactly the type of game the world champion needed to really find his groove uh, in this day two of the World Rapid Championship. Of course, I'm going to talk a little bit more about what he did with his groove in the next video coming your way to this YouTube channel, his victory over Vietnamese and former World Blitz champion Laquang Liam. So uh, that, that's going to be in the next video. But I really think this was a good game to just set the tempi and set the tone that Magnus was, uh, was going to have a position that he felt he could push. Queen to c7. Here comes the rook to e1 so that when we do eventually get e4, the queen, as I said, is on this diagonal here perhaps with intentions to come over here to the queen's side, to the king's side dark squares. Queen to c7, queen g5, rook g to g8, rook c1, rook h5, queen e3. Now e5 by black is, I would argue, um, if, not, if not the mistake in the game, I think from a practical point of view, black is still in it after e5. But you start to get a feeling that black's plan is very disjointed. With the rooks disconnected, Playing for a move that like e5, when you're opening the center, typically you want optimal coordination, right? So if we're looking for the educational tip you can put in your pocket here, what's the what's the takeaway of maybe why Lesnika gets in trouble here? It is rapid, but the point is that when you when you start to open the center and you just look at white's pieces here, the rooks coordinated on the e and the c file, right? The queen and knight basically helping each other to attack critical squares within the middle of the board. It's usually not the right time to try to challenge your opponent in the most critical area when your rooks basically aren't coordinated in the same spots. So e5 to me, when I saw this move, I was like, Ugh, right? A little bit, little bit risky there. Um, sitting on the position, asking Magnus what to do next. Yes, this has been a flexible opening for you, but where are you going now, big guy, right? If you play e5, you can back up the knight. And again, you've maintained a very, very solid pawn chain. Uh, taking, of course, not only brings the knight, but as long as the rook is here, might even bring a rook into the center, right? So I think there were other things Black could have done here, including maybe bring this rook over to c8 to try to overprotect the area of the board that Magnus clearly wants to open when he puts the rook on c1. So I think there were other things to do here other than e5. And after e5, you see Magnus strike here. This is just the kind of uh, awareness of what you need to do in a position that the world champion shows so well, right? The rooks are disconnected, as I said. An open center will likely favor white because of that, right? That's the educational takeaway. So Magnus decides, I'm going to do just that. He takes and plays c4. Really splitting the board here because the only way for the for the Czech Republic Grandmaster here to keep it closed is to play a move like d4, which is what he did, right? But in doing so, he fully commits that this rook on h5 feels lost, right? It, and... It really puts Black in a position where he's several moves away from being able to coordinate optimally, and Magnus takes advantage of that timing. Uh, if you play a move like D takes C4 instead of D4, White has a number of ways to regain, including just B3, followed by takes and rook over. And even though it's not as closed as it was in the game, the rook is still out of play, blocked because of the E5 pawn, and Magnus is still very, very quickly opening up the queen side for, for some play here that is probably going to take advantage of Black's uncoordinated rooks. So d4 was played, likely just to gain a tempo to maybe try to give black the time to re-coordinate. Queen d2, the knight comes back to d7. You'd really love to fill this square, blockade the dark square, say I'm going to have time to bring my pieces back around and coordinate. But Magnus shakes the Dikembe Mutombo and says, no thank you. You're never going to use that square again here. After c5, the rook comes to h6, but here comes b4. So I, I just really love how quickly this game switched, right? That it went from kind of poking and prodding, flexible system, to really recognizing how quickly he could open up the queen side, open up the center, and expose Black's uncoordinated rooks. And that's why Magnus is able to go on here to this very, very awesome queen side attack. Slides the queen over. He's threatening b5. 
So black stops it. But guess what? It's only temporary because after queen b3 and the rook comes over, this, as soon as I have a chance to get a4, it's coming. And that's what Magnus does, followed by b5, followed by more pieces coming over here to the queen side. After rook to c8, you can pause the video if you want to find just the kind of obvious knockout blow, but it's time to calculate, buckle up, and put this thing away. The move c6 is played. Of course, black cannot take it twice because the only way to stop mate would be knight b6, which loses a piece. So because of that, black played the move knight to b6 right away. Here comes a5 anyway. Knight to a8, and now we take b7. Uh, a little bit of just kind of smoke here as the, as the guns are, are coming out and uh, moves are being played with Tempe. But really, this position is already basically over for black. The knight comes in, coming to c5. You give it to an engine. I think white is probably almost plus 5 at this point, which says something when it's equal material and you're up that much. Knight to c7. Here comes the knight. Here comes the pawn. We're going to do dirty things here along the a-file after b7 check. We trade, and now rook to c8, and Lisnika resigns. So, again, start to finish, a flexible opening, playing a London system, something he could control the tempi, not be worried about preparation from his opponent, and feels like he could push on. Gets a very flexible middle game where he just waits for the right time, his opponent opening excuse me, opening the center a little bit too early, a little bit uncharacteristically, or let's say uh, a less than ideal when your rooks aren't connected that way. Magnus doesn't need to be asked twice. He opens the position, uses the queen side uh, to, uh, to, the, to the best possible ability, especially with black's pieces on the king side being out of play and needing time, and then executes an attack very, very well. So uh, not, not the flashiest game, not the most fireworks, but I think a, a very well-executed game by Magnus, by the way, moves like rook to b6 uh well they failed to a number of things but b8 check is uh is the the biggest reason and it's probably just a forced checkmate here if you take including just winning the queen so uh anyway just that was as i was talking to everybody that tactic was in my head on rook b6 what do i do if i take d8 he takes b4 with check and then i lose b7 if i take b6 he takes with the queen with check so sorry the uh the, the chess player in me was kicking in and i had to answer that final tactic that i didn't prepare normally i analyze these games very deeply for you all which i did here but uh, I didn't have that last tactic solved. But anyway, it's just b8 queen, and you have the x-ray tactic where both your queen and the rook are hitting the square. And so it is game over, red rover, send Magnus Carlsen right over. And uh, please check out the next video here where I analyze his victory over Laquang Liam.